It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Aaron Nicholas, DDS, a practicing dentist and international speaker with over 30 years of experience. He graduated from the University of Maryland Dental School in 1987. That's the same year I was. So, dude, I know you're old, Aaron. Just try to live through to the end of the podcast. We both graduated 147 years after the University of Baltimore, Maryland uh, opened, and that's where he went to dental school. He is the founder and CEO of Monday Morning Dentistry, Smile Protection Dental Plan, the Dental Assistant School of Maryland, and Nicholas Dental Care. He is a frequent guest on dental podcasts, including The Dentalpreneur, The Relentless Dentist, Dentist Implants and Worms, The Better Dentistry Podcast, Life and Dentistry Podcast, Craig Cody and Company, and Dental Practice Heroes. He has authored numerous video courses, including The One Hour Molar Root Canal Buildup and Crown, Ultimate Anesthesia, Profitable Hygiene Without Bloodshed, and Efficient Extractions for the General Practitioner. He is the developer and instructor for the one-hour Molar Root Canal Buildup and Crown hands-on course. He is a regular participant in the Dominican Republic Dental Mission trip and has made the excursion 20 times to help provide dental services to the less fortunate in that country. I could go on and on and on, and I'm so excited to get the man himself on the phone, uh, on the podcast, but I got to tell you that... um, Being a, um, you know, I graduated in 87, started my media company in 1994, and it's now 2020, so that's, uh, if I only knew algebra, I could tell you how many years that was, but in all that time, the most controversial feature we ever did was by a dentist named Scott Perkins, who did an article called The 15-Minute Root Canal, and it caused such an outrage. I, I had endodontists in Toronto banning me to ever speak in Toronto, you know, like, like I, like whatever. I mean, you know, and, and, and I'm sure the same buffoon would be for uh, freedom of speech, uh, but just not speech he doesn't like. Uh, but the bottom line is um, a couple of my friends, we thought, is this guy for real? And the locals that knew him um, said it's for real. So uh, me and Jerome Smith and a bunch of other guys, we actually flew down there and it blew my mind because what he showed me was, you know, you take an end on this, and he says, oh, it takes at least an hour. Well, he would take out the slow speed. He'd switch the latch. He'd put in a file. He'd waste all this time. And then he'd go dip, dip a couple times, and he'd be doing that process, whereas Scott had four slow speeds out. And before he sat down, one was already loaded with a 15, a 20, a 25. It was just all systems. Mm-hmm. And what I realized was it was a review of, um, of um, the first controversial guy I met, Omar Reed, who yep. I'm going to his funeral at the end of this month on the last Saturday of this month at 11, is um, the fact that um, Omar um, wrote an article called The 90-Second Crown Prep, and yep. they tried to destroy his reputation, but no one would ever listen to what he said. And what he said is he sat with a timer, and he sat behind other people, and I watched him, and the actual amount of drilling time was a minute and a half. It yep. was drill, rinse, dry, look. Drill, rinse, yep. dry, look. Real and oh, oh, Margaret, will you get up from your chair and go into the sterilization room and get that one thing that we use every single time we've ever done a crown prep yep. since yep. since the beginning of time? And yep. and, and um, in fact, Omar um, really, um, really, um, um, my my staff was very upset because I started a deal where if you had to get up and leave the room, then I got up and left to you, with you. But I went to the office manager. And said, you know, how would you like to be getting a bypass surgery and something that's necessary during every bypass is not in the yep. room because you're a bunch of buffoons. And they'd say, well, we only have one. I'm like, well, we then get eight. I mean, we have eight operatories. Southwest Airlines has hundreds of 737 Boeings. They're all identical. Every yep. operatory is identical. And then I yep. go into, uh, I'll watch other dentists and they'll go in and do a crown check and uh, or a hygiene check. And I'll say, oh yeah, you just need a little occlusal. It'll only take me 10 minutes. Well, hey dude, can you do it now? Oh uh, no, because we'd have to switch the room and, and we're not set up. And, and, and it's like, Dude, you're you're in an operator right now. Yeah, but it doesn't have a high speed and a triturator. Well, then get a high speed and a triturator. Yeah. And then they'll say, well, it might run over in the next patient's here. We'll have the hygienist go start the next her next patient in another room. And then the hygienist like, well, this is my room, and and I can only work in this room, and and I have I have a picture of my nine month old newborn baby rat on the wall, and I can't do. You know, it's like, oh my god, it's just logistics, logistics, and that's what you are. You're an operations and logistics guy that's 
That's a lot of it. It's interesting. All those guys you talked about, that's my journey. I started with Omar Reed, and I, I looked at his stuff. When Carl Perkins came out with his stuff, I flew down to Houston and took his course and went through, through all of that. Then I looked at uh, developing some of my own stuff and making templates that go on the, the, um, the deliveries so that they don't have to remember what goes on. They just look down there. If you see a box and it has words in it, that's what's missing. Just go get that. And then we, uh, we, nice. put, together, we put together carts for all our procedures that have lots of little bits and pieces. So we have endo carts. We actually have two, one for the doc, one for the assistant. And uh, so once you get finished doing the endo, you just restock, clean up the cart, you park it in the in the cart parking lot. The next time you just wheel those two things in, you drop down the template, you open up the cassette, you pull a few things out for disposables, you're good to go. Um, our setup time is like seven minutes. So that, you know, you get somebody comes in, they have a toothache, they need the root canal, you got a 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 minute window. You're not wasting time trying to get the room set up. You know, you can get the room set up while the financial arrangements are getting made and then you can get to work. But the, uh, I have the same frustrations you do with, you know, it's, we do this procedure every time we need this thing every time. And then they have to be calling for it on the radio or go up to go get it. It's like, come on. I mean, how many times a month do we do this thing? Aren't, aren't you tired of getting up and walking down the hallway? One one of the biggest threads on Dental Town, and I wish you would make a post on that. It's called "Has anybody analyzed profitability of procedures with PPO participation?" It's like eight pages long, and and I've seen my homies think like this since day one. They think the longer they spend, the higher the quality. And all the research from Regina Hertzlinger is actually the opposite. Let, let's take oral surgery. Um, an oral surgeon could pull all your wisdom teeth. What, how long do you think an oral surgeon would take to pull the average four set four wisdom teeth? I'd say thirty minutes max. Yeah, and what would the general dentist time be? Oh, like an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah. So who's a better quality? Let, let's go yeah. molar endo. Uh, a retreat on a maxillary second molar. How long would the average endodontist take? I'll bet it's two visits, and I'll bet it's an hour and a half each visit. Okay, that was a bad example. Just a standard initial root canal on a uh, on an on a second molar. Probably an hour and a half, something okay. like that. And how long would the general dentist take? Uh, two, three, usually two visits. Yeah, you want yeah, to yeah. Two visits so, so, sure. so, so Regina Hertzlinger called it the facts focus factor, and the first literature she found out was that when it just came to an appendectomy. I mean, it's a straight incision. You remove the appendix. No, no, right. no, no, no. I'm sorry. It was a hernia. Sorry. Um, but another deal, just a straight incision, tuck the intestine back in, make some stitches. The doctors who had it under eight minutes, they had no failures and no second visits emergency. By the time you were 16 minutes, it was like a 10% failure rate. And she's like, wow, these are all old. I mean, a cross section of doctors of all ages and schools. And the bottom line is if you know what you're doing, you do it fast. If you know what equipment technology you need, it's sitting there. So, so, my, so when you are taking a PPO, you know, when, 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 when you, when you get, when you charge a thousand dollars for a crown, it's cash only. Mm -hmm. You numb up the patient and then you walk back to your private office and sip some coffee for 10 minutes. And then you walk back in there and you prep and then you say, well, I'm going to delegate. I'm a businessman. Then you have the assistant pack the cord. Then you leave for another 15 minutes. And, and, and then the whole thing ends up taking an hour and a half. But when you actually sit down and numb them up with septicane, set a timer for four minutes. While that's soaking in, you take the shade. Um, you fill out the lab script. Um, and then at four minutes, ding, you pack the zero cord. Then you pack the one cord. Then you pull out a 57 burr, take out your contacts, take out the old restoration. Then you prep the crown. You get it all done. And then right there, you make the temporary because with the assistant, you can make the temporary in three or four minutes. But when you make the temporary, you can check. Can I see the margin on the temporary? Well, if you can't see it on the temporary, how the hell are you going to see an impression? And then, and when, what about uh, your uh, occlusal? You know, when you when you get a reduction coping back from the lab, that means you took the impression before you made the temporary. So don't ever do that again. So you make the temporary and you drill through the temporary. You're like, I don't have enough reduction. So then you do your plunger cost for more reduction. And then you make the second temporary. It's all fine. And then you take the impression and uh, or scan or whatever. And you're done in half an hour. But the dentist across the street says, oh, well, you know that guy over there. You know, he only, he, he only schedules 45 minutes for a crown. He's a hack. I take an hour and a half to do a crown because I'm yeah. quality. Now, you're not quality, dude. You're you're freaking slow, and oh. no nobody wants a slow dentist. Yeah. So so yeah. so what what mindset? What of all the dentists on earth, two million dentists on earth, what percent of them believe in their heart? The longer 
time they spend and the slower they go, the higher the quality will be. I think that's more than half. I think oh, most yeah. of the time you talk to the dentist about, you know, somebody does something fast, the very next thing is, well, what's the quality like? Yeah, he's only a half an hour, but what's the quality like? And the truth of the matter is, you know, even like with extracting teeth, you know, if you're going to go in there and take a tooth out and you have to remove bone, well, you can sit in there and tug on that tooth for an hour, let everything get all dried out, finally <laughs> go remove the bone that you need to remove, get everything finished up. That patient's going to be in pain when, you, when come morning, okay? But if you went in there and went, oh, I have to remove the bone, you take the bone out real quick, you take the, the, the roots out, and then you close everything up, that patient generally isn't in a lot of pain because you haven't been just fiddling around for an hour, hour and a half and, and making everything get worse. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Um, but I, I wish you would make a, a post on that thread um, because I think that uh, necessity, uh, I'll say, Aaron, will you uh, post on this thread? Because um, I Great. think um, I think that um, it's, it's obvious that it's all operations and logistics, whereas the uh, most people think that it's all about having uh, some great idea. They always say things like, oh, I wish I would have thought of that. Well, hell, look at McDonald's, dude. They're on the intersection of First and Main. They have a drive through for 60% of their customers. They sell a hamburger, fry, and a Coke. I see the lot across the street is a bankrupt gas station. Why don't you go buy that and compete with McDonald's? Mm-hmm. I yeah. wish I thought of that. Well, it's just all operations and logistics. It's not the idea. It's the logistics. Uh, I even see that. I, I mean, anyway, I go on on where dentists will get an idea and they'll spend the first two years and all their seed capital getting patents and patents and patent lawyers and protections. And while they're doing all that, some other guy will go make a prototype, sell it to his buddy across the street, and 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 have three iterations of this thing, and then is. Uh, um, sells it to ultra dent before the other guy gets his uh, patent attorney back. Yeah. I mean, execution is king. You know, if you're, if you've got an idea, great, get out there because by executing the first version, you actually learn more to make the second version better. Um, I, I started teaching that hands-on course for that one hour mobile root canal belt crown. I had it all figured out. I went through in the very first part of the hands-on course, I realized that everybody was doing their access openings wrong. And I'm like, well, I, I told them, I showed them, I showed them pictures and so I, I just called everybody back. I said, hey, guys, here, let, me, let me show you what I'm talking about when I said this thing. And then I did it myself. And all of a sudden, everybody's doing great access openings. Now they have nice straight line access into the, the root canal system and life's getting better for them. You know? And that happened to me over and over and over because I learned that what I was saying, while it was very clear to me, wasn't clear to them because they're running it through the filter of what they usually do. And so you have to go through and break the old habits to get into some newer habits that are going to serve you better. Well, let's make this a selfish, narcissistic interview just for my own world. Um, I, I, you know, this is what when I was when I was getting ready to talk to you today, I want to ask you an age-old question that I'm confused at. Um, so when we were back in dental school, remember, I'm just as old as you, but I don't have an AOL.com email. Um, okay, I, I, I'm I'm proud that uh, that out. What's that? I said me either. I just want to point that out. <laughs> Um, but you know, when we were in dental school, there's a lot of people that thought the failed root canal came from the bottom, that that Mm -hmm. bacteria came out of the bloodstream and got in between that gutta and started living there. And then later that was proved wrong that indeed all the bacteria was crowned down to leak. So you see a failed root canal and it's failing. And I see these endodontists and they drill an access hole and go through there and they redo the whole root canal, but you didn't solve the first problem how, what was getting down there. And then you're talking about access. I always, when I do a molar root canal, I always take off the crown and Mm -hmm. I always prepare it for the final restoration first. And that makes the access just mind blowingly easy. And then I see these, uh, these uh, dentists doing a a retreat, a root canal through a crown and through like a BB size hole. And And yeah. And it's like, and I'll say, and I'll say, well, why didn't you redo the crown? They go, Oh, well, it's a new crown. It's only like six months old. It's like, yeah, but the lab bill is a hundred bucks. You're, you know, I mean, who who cares? I'd rather I'd rather put on a new crown. I, I imagine if you took your car in to get its radiator repaired, but they had to drill a hole through the hood, and then they repaired it with a weld done. And then, well, you know, we didn't want to buy a new hood. Um, so so for me, the, the, the succinct question is: If a root canal has failed, would you redo the root canal through the old crown, or would you assume the crown's leaking as a source of bacteria and take off the crown? I take the crown off both because it makes it easier to do the root canal and because you can't see everything under the crown. So it may be leaking someplace you're not seeing 
And so you make your little hole and you do your retreat and your root canal is great, but there's this little chunk of decay under the distal lingual margin that you couldn't see or get to. And all of a sudden that's going to decay away the rest of what's underneath there. And then there you are two, three, four years later trying to explain to the patient why the crown fell off and the tooth's not restorable anymore. So I, I would much rather replace the crown. Yeah, and when I, and have, has this ever happened to you in 32 years? Uh, it happened to me, but maybe I'm a hack, but um, you uh, prepare the tooth for the final restoration and realize the tooth's not even restorable. Um, you know, that MOD amalgam, the cracks, and, and by the time you get all ready for your final restoration, you're like, you know what, this, this tooth needs extracted in an implant. Has that ever happened to you? Yeah, less less now, thankfully, but yeah, especially early on in practice, I had that happen with bunch. Yeah, and um, and and by the way, you, the you kids out there have to remember that um, when we got out of school, everyone who had placed thirty thousand implants in their life only did it on a pano, and uh, yeah. they didn't have a CBCT. I had I had my diplomat in the International Congress of Plantology before I even knew anybody who had a three D imaging machine. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I didn't even know anybody that had one. It was all 2D. In fact, I'm so old, we thought the coolest thing on radiography was how they put the R on the one side and the L on the other. I mean, <laughs> I, I thought that was that was a CBT of my time. So so when you're, so let's just, um, um, well, let, let's finish root canals. Um, before I went, sure. I was going to go into some other things, but um, how, what would you say to someone who says, dude, you're a hack. You can't do a molar root canal in an hour. Um. First off, I'd show them completed root canals that have been done in an hour and say, can you tell me how long these different root canals took, which most people will have to say no. Um, secondly, I'd say, let's, you know, come and watch. Thirdly, I'd say, let's talk about the process and how long it should really take you to, to do these things, you know, and, and a lot of it depends on when I'm, when I'm teaching the course, a lot of times I'll tell people, you know, you need everything in the room and you need it out. And that means out on the counter. That means you don't have to go into a drawer. You don't have to open up anything. It's there and it's ready to go. A lot like Perkins four cordless motors with the the proper file in each one. You know, it's the same kind of thing. It's like it's got to be up and ready to go. You can't be be going to get it. And, but, sh- and shout outside. out and shout out to Scott Perkins, man. Love that guy. I mean that that that's a dentist. I swear to God. I, I mean I just love him because he's he's um, always a scientist first. You know, Galileo said. Science is not a democracy. I don't care if a thousand people uh, vote and they say the earth, um, the sun goes around the the, the earth. Um, I'm sorry, but him and Copernicus said it, it. It's not a democracy. The earth goes around the sun. And Scott Perkins, um, well, you can just tell the way his walnut brain works. It's very Newtonian that when you're telling him something, he's trying to see it mathematically and he's going to decide if it makes sense and he agrees or if he's, it's disconnected and doesn't work mathematically and he's on to the next thing. I just, just love the way his mind works. Right. But, well, you know, a lot, too, is that if you're, if you're not doing things that are going to create problems for you, then you can go through the process a lot faster. You know, so you're, you're packing a couple of cords before you're really prepping that tooth. And one of the things you're avoiding is bleeding that you're then going to have to deal with in order to get through the procedure. So if you start with root canal therapy, and you, you do your occlusal reduction, you prep for your crown, you take away the, the decay and the old restoration, you've just removed a bunch of tooth structure that otherwise you're going to work around for 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes and then turn around and cut it off anyway. So why not get everything out of the way, get yourself as clear a path as you can, and then go from there. And sometimes, like, I'm, I'm doing one of these and I'm, like, I'm prepping the tooth and I'm taking a lot of time to get everything prepped and just right. And I have to keep reminding myself, this is going to make my life easier. And now when I start my root canal, everything goes super smooth because everything is very straightforward. And I want to tell the kids uh, something very, very, very important. And when it's really important, I always repeat myself. And uh, that's why um, um, I just keep doing it. But um you're a dentist and there's 10 specialties and one of them is public health. And I know when you come out of school, you, you part ways and half of you uh, are apical barbarians, blood and guts, pull teeth, do molar endo, all that stuff. And the other half want to be these fancy full tooth fairies doing bleaching, bonding, Invisalign and elective stuff. And that's great. But if you got $400,000 in student loans, an oral and maxillofacial surgeon averages 448,000 net a year, periodontist 330, endo 307, pediatric dentist 304. And once you slip into ortho and down, you're, uh, you're out of the 300. Orthodontists are 289, prosthodontists 219, and general dentists are at 187. So what I'm telling you is that 
when someone has an emergency, is it usually because, well, I have a fancy dinner date on Friday, and my teeth are a little dark, and I see you're wearing a pink shirt, so you're either very secure in your sexuality, but it's not really, you know, no, that, what, what is an emergency in a dental office? Man, my tooth's killing me. I yep. can't eat ice cream. I can't drink cold. I didn't sleep last night. I'm I'm eating uh, ibuprofen and, and aspirin, and I don't have to have a treatment plan presentation case presentation for you. I don't I don't need to be wearing a suit and tie. I'm 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 a fireman, and your house is on fire. You'll take me whether I took a bath or not. Um, it, you don't have to sell that stuff. They're begging to get in, and then what do you say? Oh well, we we don't do that. Um, the real doctor's down the street, and we're going to send you there, and he can't get you in for four days. And, and they, they, they never forget that. I, I, I was on fire. I went to your office, and right. you couldn't even throw your coffee at me, and you sent me away. And, and um, when I look at these DSO guys, you know, like Starbucks, another uh, um, Howard Schultz, you know, he opens up a bunch of Starbucks every year. And the next year, he'll close a bunch of them down and open up a bunch of new ones. And these DSOs, they open up a practice. And if it's not doing seven root canals a month after 90 days, they know something is seriously wrong. And if it's at under seven root canals a month at the end of the one year, they go to the greater fool theory, which no matter how absurdly high this stock is, you can sell it because someone's dumber than you. You know, you right. may be dumb, but there's 8 billion people out there. And um, and I know at least one of them is dumber than me, and someone will buy this dental office. So they'll list the dental office and sell it and try to get to some better demographics. But if, if you're walking out of dental school $400,000 in debt and you say you don't want to do molar endo and extract teeth, um, I, I hope you marry well. <laughs> well, I mean, the other thing too is, listen, you go out, you have your marketing plan, you want to do social media, you're going to do mailers, flyers, you're going to go out and uh, and go to the, the town parade or whatever and, and, and have your table there. You're going to meet a bunch of people. So people now know you, then they have a problem, they come in to see you. And it's like, oh, you have a, you know, if, if someone has that pain, it's either a molar root canal, because they're never the easy ones up front. Or it's a um, a tooth that's decayed that needs to be extracted, and I don't mean decayed a little bit, but like decayed down in the bone to where you got to pull out root tips and stuff. And it's going to be one of those two things. So if you can't handle those, you're now the triage service for your endodontist or your oral surgeon. And then once the emergency's over, it's done. But if you can do that in office, if you can take care of them, you can look them in the eye and go, dude, like, I am so sorry that you're having this problem. I'm glad we got you squared away today, but let's get you back in so we're not just putting out fires for you. Let's get you in, get a good cleaning, and let's figure out what else is going on so you don't have to live through this again. And you have a relationship, and they'll actually start to come back. Whereas if you send them down to the oral surgeon and go, hey, when you get finished over there, come on back, they don't come back. I mean, that's, that's the guy that took care of them down there, not you. And also, the, the biggest error everyone makes all day long is projecting their personal bias onto the decision at hand. And so you're a dentist and you want to do bleaching, bonding, and Invisalign. Well, you're, you're, you're not the 30,000 people of Parsons, Kansas. You don't know what they want. And they came knocking on your door because they got a toothache and want this tooth pulled. And you already decided that you're not going to do that. Right. Well, <laughs> well, where the hell did that come from? Because you didn't, you say, well, I'm a dentist. I paid for my school. I'm pretty sure most of these schools were paid for um, the majority by the public. Like I went to University of Missouri, Kansas City. Um, dental school tuition didn't even pick up 20% of the cost. Uh, the, the state of Missouri and the state of Kansas and, and New Mexico and Hawaii. Hawaii paid 7%. Um, New Mexico pays 7%. That's why they each get seven seats. Kansas gets 30 seats and then Missouri gets the rest. And the, and the reason the state government paid for those schools is because they need um, access. I can't believe you're interrupting me during a podcast, Lori. At least come say hi. No, you got to say hi to Aaron. You got to say hi to Aaron. He's wearing a pink shirt. Come on, look how fancy he looks. This is my. Uh, this is my. This is no Kyle. Do not edit this out. This is my partner in crime for Hello. twenty years. I could not have done it without you, Lori. And um, I'll tell you the real story as soon as she shuts the door and leaves. And, uh, but, um, so the, b the bottom line is that the, the government, um, you know, Churchill said at the end of World War II, we're not going to rebuild England with a bunch of sick people who are uneducated. So let's start building some schools and hospitals and get a workforce that can read and write and is not coughing and sneezing and dying. And so the government did that because they need access to public health. 
And the best access to public health is delivered by free enterprise where an owner operator owns the thing, has skin in his own game. And you show up on his door and say, hey, I have a toothache. You can fix that. They don't go to the hospital and say, I broke my leg. And the hospital says, oh, we don't do legs. We, we just do arms and ears. Sorry. Uh, so, so man up. Be a real doctor. And if you can't pull a tooth and do a root canal, you need to go to Kohl's and buy some big boy pants. <laughs> and Okay, so your websites. Um, by, by the way, it's extra romantic talking today because I'm talking to you on a Monday morning. And you yep. are the Monday Morning Dentistry dot com doctor. So if you yeah. go to Monday Morning Dentistry dot com, um, the first thing I um, went to is your online courses, and you have a one hour molar root canal buildup and crown course. And of course, it's six ninety seven. So I'm going to hear a dentist with four hundred thousand dollars of student loan say, "Well, it's six hundred ninety seven. Well, how much is your first root canal going to cost?" Yeah. Oh, oh okay. just the whole six hundred ninety seven. Oh, so you won't go learn ortho from Rick Lett even though his course costs less than your first Invisalign case. I mean, come on. So it, yeah. takes, it takes money to make money. So so tell us about your journey. What made you make a one-hour molar root canal buildup and crown course um, for 697 at mondaymorningdentistry.com? So I got out of dental school, same year you did, and I opened up a practice right away. And by the end of year two, I was going bankrupt and happened to hire a, uh, a consultant, which, you know, I was just lucky to even find one. I didn't even know they existed because back then there's no internet and there's no podcast. And, you know, I just happened. It was a side conversation with a periodontist. Hired them. They said, hey, you need to come and do some CE courses. And I'm like, I just got out of dental school. I know everything there is to know about dentistry because I just got out of dental school. Why do I need to go CE courses? And they said, well, it'd be good for you. You might learn something and it's free. And I was like, okay, those are my those are three really good reasons. Um, you were actually one of the first people I heard speak. Oh, um, my gosh. I'm, so sorry, was, I'm sorry that happened. I, 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 you're a survivor. This, this might be, I might be able to work this out. So anyway, I, I went to a lot of courses, and some of them were complete fluff, and some of them were like, I could just go back on Monday and start putting stuff into, into place. So um, I had a lot of people help me. I kind of wanted to give back. I had someone ask me if I wanted to do, uh, help some younger guys, and I said, sure. And so I started doing some speaking for him. And then I started putting together these courses as I was talking to younger guys who were having problems with some of these areas in their practices. So that's how the courses got done. And Monday morning dentist, because I didn't want to waste anyone's time. And I wanted them to be able to go to course or, or buy a course and watch it. And Monday morning, be able to go back and institute things that would make their lives easier, uh, more profitable and kind of move them along their path. So that's, that's why Monday morning dentistry. And that's why, the courses and there's still some stuff in development of course okay well i know my homies well and i know them well um, and thanks for always uh shooting me an email howard at dentaltown.com i really love hearing uh who i'm talking to and i love the comments in the youtube channel but i know what they're thinking and the first thing they're thinking is um well what's better your online course or your hands-on course if you have the ability to get to the hands-on course i would do that if I go to the hands-on course, do I get the online video course? Um, we don't usually do that. I can work out some kind of a deal, though. If they say how he said you would, would you do it? <laughs> I can make that happen. You, you know why? You know why I like that because oh, you know the research. You know we've been doing online CE for a lot of years, and and the best feedback we get on it, it, it originally I never even thought of it. They say I don't have to take notes. I don't have to write anything down. It's a one-hour course. If he shows a chart. And I want to see that chart again. I can just go back, open up that course, go to the chart, print it out, whatever. But, you know, when they're sitting there and they don't have that video, they're just going to be taking notes. And then you got to walk around with a fire extinguisher and put out fires with their pencil, you know. But um, I, I, I think it's a um, it's a way you can just relax. Say, just try to learn it. Just try to see what he's saying. You can always go back and watch the video later. But that, that would be my uh, that would be my recommendation. But anyway, but you recommend the hands-on course. And, yeah, I mean. And is Generally, that a one day, a two day? That's that's a one day. It's it's a one day. I usually give them the printout of the the um, the PowerPoint presentation, and then I have a laminated sheet that has there, there's two things that I think are super important for them to have, and that would be useful to have in the operatory. So I actually laminate that sheet and hand that out of the course, so they have that to take home and, and have it for a reference uh, in the course or in the operatory when they're they're working. Okay, I think another question they're going to have is on your website, you say that one-hour course, um, the next one's April 10th? April 10th at my office, yep. 
and your office is in? Burtonsville, Maryland, halfway between Baltimore and Washington, D.C. Baltimore, Baltimore. Didn't they used to have a football team? They still have a football team. Uh, I, I was so <laughs> dumb. I was betting. I lost money um, with uh, my son's uh, father-in-law that um, uh, I, I thought Baltimore was going to go all the way. I, 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 I picked them in the Super Bowl deal. And uh, which, um, uh, but anyway, um, so it's April 10th in Baltimore or halfway right. between Baltimore from eight to five. Uh, but the price on it says it's between 297 dollars and $1,897. 297 is if you want to bring a, a staff member, like an assistant, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, the, the 1897 is for the, um, is for the doc and for people that are townies that are listening to your podcast and put in a code county 20. And uh, and get a discount off that. Townie twenty. Yep. And what's a twenty for? The year twenty well, twenty. Yeah, twenty twenty. Okay. Um. So if they put townie twenty when they that's, buy it, what happens? They, they get, a, then they get a discount. Okay. Um. Not to be rude, but uh, you need to clean up that two ninety seven slash eighteen ninety seven because I know I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, uh, but I, I I couldn't figure it out. And if I couldn't figure out, there's at least one guy. There's just <laughs> one guy. Um, number. So it says um, participants will learn or expand their knowledge of how to perform predictable painless anesthesia for root canal therapy. What my goal is, is to get you to uh, share all your beans so there's no reason to ever go to your course or see you ever again. Uh, but um, So how are you going to teach them to perform predictable painless anesthesia? I know what you're going to do. You're going to say, um, I'm going to leave right now and the hygienist is going to come in and numb you. Did I get it right? Yeah. That also works well. <laughs> Not in my state, but that works well. That's what I've been state. doing in Arizona. Oh, my God. And now they started an EFTA program. So, uh, oh, my gosh. I just love it. When you go to those states with EFTA programs, these doctors, they're operatory. You know, when they're, they're doing their major work, but they got a couple hygienists going and a couple EFTAs. So, they'll go in there in the morning, and the hygienists will go numb the two EFTAs. And, uh, and then uh, they'll do – and then they'll go in there and do the prep, and then they leave, and they – They'll put on the Matrix, the rubber dam, the finish oh, yeah. the whole dang thing. I mean, it's just uh, it's just amazing. But anyway, um, so w- what are you going to teach them on to perform predictable painless anesthesia? Is it going to be septicane instead of lidocaine? It's for sure going to be septicane. There's there's so much misinformation about septicane out there that I've run through all of the, the research with that, and there's nothing wrong with septicane. Even for IA blocks, it's, it's still fine. Um, we talk about... You know, timing, we talk about using uh, PDL and uh, using some of the adjuncts with that. Um, just a, a number of different things. And then really just, you know, knowing your, uh, knowing your anatomy and, and knowing don't give the injection the way that you learned in dental school. There's other things that you can do to make that work out better, you know. And, so, and I just want to say that um, Stanley Malamed was on episode um, uh, 971, and just on YouTube alone, it got 2,500 views. And he's the the consultant on all the lawsuits, and there's nothing dangerous about septicane, but the yeah. myth just per- keeps going yeah. and going and going, yeah. and it I comes down to. Uh, people just believe what they want to believe, even though there's no data for what they want to believe. But if you think septicane uh, causes all this stuff, you're wrong. It's the needle poking the lingual yep. nerve when you're given the injection. Uh, yep. But anyway. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. When they started looking at those studies, um, they found out that all those incidents of, uh, of paresthesia using septicane were in North America and not over in Europe, even though they've been using it in Europe for years and years and years before it ever came over here. So, yeah. So why was that? Did the they have the same theory you did that it that the um, uh, that the uh, it's the injection technique is the problem. It's not the anesthetic. So so how how do you advise them to do a painless anesthetic? You you recommend that they um, switch to septicane. Switch septicane. What else? You, use something that doesn't have a um, uh, a vasoconstrictor in it first, because as soon as you add epinephrine, you decrease your pH, which is going to make it burn. So let's use something that's more. Uh, that's more kind to the tissues and then stop using hurricane and start using a, uh, a compounded topical that's going to give be a lot stronger and it's going to work a lot faster and work a lot better. Um, and you put those three things together and you're most of the way to a painless uh, injection. I have, uh, I have patients that come through all the time and that, like I'll send them to the oral surgeon for something and they'll come back and they'll go, you know, he's a nice guy, did a great job, but um, you know, he, it really hurts when he gives me a needle. 
And I was like, oh, okay. So I made up like care packages for my specialists and like took it to their offices and tried to be really nice about it. And I think they ran through it and stopped using it is what happened. But uh, I never heard that they, no one ever said, oh, that was a great idea. They just, they, they I think they used it up and, and they were done. I don't think they were that interested in doing that. You know, the, the one thing I noticed with um, on my journey getting out is that um, if I started feeling stressful or tense or whatever, mm -hmm. at first I didn't know what was going on. Then I realized I'm picking that up from the patient. So, yeah. so you know when the when you know they start moving or tensing, you're moving or tensing, and I still see the young kids. You know when they're young, because when they get done giving the injection, they'll they'll put the needle down on the tray and then they they stand up. They have they have to leave the room, and as they're leaving the room, they exhale. I'm like, uh, oh, yeah. dang, they were holding their breath the whole time. So yeah. everyone just needs to relax because if you're stressing out on the shot, he's picking yep. that up from you, and if yep. you're feeling stress and you don't know why you're picking up from him so so um so a lot of it's just in the delivery the persona and even a lot of it's like like you were doing when you were discussing that like you had your your shoulders up and your and your head was kind of scooched down in your arm and i've caught myself doing that giving an injection my shoulders up around my ears it's like you know let's like put the shoulders down let's relax breathe you know, it, it all makes, I mean, you can be mid injection and make that change and you can see that that actually translates to your patient. Okay. So next is identify why single visit root canal therapy billet and crown is preferable to multiple visits. I mean, to me that, that that's obvious. I mean, it's like same day dentistry. Everybody, everybody, everybody talks about same day dentistry and the guys uh, wearing the NASCAR suits selling the machine, they tell you, Oh, you'll do this in an hour. And then when we're on dental town and in the trenches, you know, it's, it's more like two hours to two and a half to three. And mm -hmm. I, I don't want to go sit in a doctor's room for three flipping hours. I don't want to come back for, how would you like to, you know, when I get my first bypass, I don't want to hear, well, you need a quadruple bypass, but we're just going to do one valve a month for the next four months because that's all your insurance. You know, you just want to go in there and be done. Yeah, I mean, at this point to me, this should be like general information, but I still run across docs all the time. A lot of our young docs where they think it's better to do two visits to you know, let it heal in between, let it settle, you know, all that. And the same thing for, hey, we do the root canal and then we wait to do the crown because we want to make sure the root canal takes and, and that sort of thing. And I was I was talking to a young doc and, and he kept saying that. And I said, so what percentage of your root canals work? He's like, well, you know, like the usual, like everybody else, you know, like 95, 96, 97%. I'm like, so why don't you just cut the crown then? Because if, you're, if your um, treatment is 97% successful, then you should pretty much be counting on it being successful every time. So just go ahead and do the crown at the same time. But what if it doesn't work? That's 3% of the time. What's your lab bill? Okay. And then start looking at all the extra money that you're spending by breaking it up into multiple visits and, um, and, and having that patient occupy that chair for an extra hour when you could have just taken an extra 10 minutes and got it all knocked out right there. You know, my favorite thread on dental town right now is, um, uh, what are the zombie ideas in dentistry that have been thoroughly refuted by a mountain of empirical evidence, but nonetheless refuses to die, being continually reaminated by our deeply held beliefs? And it's, it notice, I've noticed one thing. It's all old farts posting on this stuff. And right. I'm telling you, it's just the way humans are. Um, ideas, zombie ideas die slowly. So uh, look at look at Galileo, his birthday, his 456th birthday uh, was uh, Saturday, so you should at least on wish him a happy birthday and tell everybody to buy loops uh, or maybe a microscope. But um, Galileo spent the last seven years of his life in prison uh, because the Catholic Church did not want to hear that the earth went around um, the sun instead of the sun going around Rome. So zombie ideas die slowly. Yeah. Well, I mean, even even like putting posts in teeth. I keep getting questions about, well, do you, do you use posts? Like, no, posts don't work. The only time I use posts is if I got a patient that's so old that we don't want to take the tooth out, so we'll put a post in there and hope it it'll uh, it'll serve her for another year or two. I mean, we're talking about somebody in their nineties that's getting ready to kick. Um, so how you would know. you how would you describe the zombie idea of septicane? Uh, the septic that uh, that you should not use septicane because it causes parasitia. Yep. Um, yeah, not use septicane. Yeah. I mean, in the course I put up like four four slides of nothing but research articles coming right off of PubMed that says it's okay to use septicane, you know, and you just, you just keep running through those over and over. And yet um, I'll still get those questions about, well, you know, what about paresthesia with uh, an, an, an IA block? And I'm like, it's just, there, there's no science that says that's the case. 
Yeah. Um. So um. My gosh. Um. Uh, um. So um. On the multiple visits versus the single one, um, there are times where you need to do a multiple visit. Do you think so? Or do you think yeah. it's more logistics? The only time I ever do multiple visits is, yeah, if I'm if I'm running out of time for some reason. Um, and that for me, that usually means I'm doing a retreat that ended up being really tough. Um, and the one hour of mobile root canal is not about retreats. It's about, you know, the first time through. Um, if I have a patient that's like super swollen, I'm still, I don't know that I need to make a second visit, but I'm still a little, a little edgy about that. And I'll go, I'll go for a second visit at that point. But yeah, because you got to look at your cost. You know, what if, what if you do the one visit and impress for a crown and then you got to go back in and revisit it, then it's costing you money. Um, um, I, I, I agree. Um, I, I don't, I don't do one visits on swollen or tissue, which is the only time you use antibiotics. Um, yeah. so, um, Understand how rearranging the order of the procedure can increase efficiency and lead to a better clinical outcome. Is that what I was saying? Numb, prepare for final restoration, then do endo. Right. Because a lot of times, guys, they're just not sure they can get it all done. And what they'll do is they'll say, well, I'll take off that top two millimeters and then I'll do the endo and then I'll prep for the crown. It's like, actually, it makes more sense logistically. It makes more sense medically. It makes more sense in every way to prep that crown first then do the root canal, and then finish it up. It just um, works works so much better. And I want to say um, I want to say one thing about the post, um, because I know um, you're never supposed to talk about religion, sex, politics, or violence, but I only know dentistry, and so I've only seen what socialized medicine, like at the NIH does uh, for the UK mm-hmm. dentist. Um, um, but back to that post comment you made, um, the great people of Japan, France, and England – um, have decided that your Bernie Sanders free socialized health care will only pay $100 for a molar in- endo. So the first thing they have to do if they're going to do molar endo is they get paid another fee for a post. So they stick mm-hmm. a post on every canal. So you say a post doesn't do anything. It, it Well, it actually does. It generates income from your socialized medicine where you believe that a government agency knows more about how to make a health care decision than a owner-operated surgeon working on you, treating you mm-hmm. as he would treat themselves. Um, and it actually does have a very good clinical <laughs> result. Uh, posts are the best at fracturing a root. I don't know anything that fractures a root better than a post. So you right. get money and you fracture the tooth. What could be wrong with that, Bernie? Because then you get to take the tooth out, and then you get to do a, 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 a bone graft, and then you get to do yeah, it, right. it does generate income. Right. Yeah. Um, so um, so then um, so I, I don't want to um, spend all the time on uh, root canal stuff um, because um, I know um, you do other stuff. So the next view online courses, and by the way, this is not a commercial. He didn't give me any money. I mean, he should have. He should have. I mean, I'm surprised. The Dairy Queen man isn't delivering a chocolate malt right now. Or, hey, will you go check and see if the Dunkin' Donuts guy is out there? Uh, but um, so another one you have is um, is um, I'm gonna have to argue with this one all day long. Profitable hygiene, and I I'm gonna have to argue with you because I've been a dentist for 32 years. I've been in a thousand dental offices, and when that dentist comes out, and I say, hey, how long's that hygienist been in there doing cleanings for you? He's ah, 10 years. And I said, well, she just did a cleaning exam and bite wings. Did you make $5.18 after taxes or did you lose 12 bucks? And he says, I don't know. In fact, this morning I was talking to Nathan um, Sparks of Open Dental about that very question that since Open Dental doesn't sync with QuickBooks Pro, you know, these dentists don't know their numbers. So when you're saying profitable hygienists, I assume that you're all just uh, hallucinating. This is a Netflix movie. Um, you just you're just all wishing it's profitable. Is it named? Is the hygienist named Ursula or Muriel? That's all I want to know because I know this is a completely fiction movie. Well, the other thing too is the, the bloodshed. Is, is it bloodshed on the patient's part or is it the bloodshed on the hygienist's part? Which was kind of it was supposed to be sort of a joke about it not having to beat the hygienist to get profitable hygiene. But in any case, no. So it's it's really about how to run an accelerated hygiene program and do it nice and smooth so that everybody's happy and your hygienist isn't going crazy and she's not feeling overworked and she gets in and does the things that she needs to do. You can do your, um, um, your other things like, you know, fluoride and, and sealants and, you know, taking impressions for night guards and whitening and you can make all that work and make the hygiene uh, department profitable. Um, but you can't do it if they're just going to like 
scrape and take x-rays occasionally. You know, you, you have to kind of be on your game. Okay, so my my a quarter of my viewers that are sending me <clears throat> emails to Howard at dentaltown.com tell me that they're, they're still a quarter still in dental school, so they don't they have no idea what accelerated hygiene program means. Okay. So let's so, get let's uh let's teach the children what that okay. means. So what that means is if you if you look at the at a hygiene procedure um, and you look at who, you know, the, the general idea in business is you get the least, the lowest paid person to do the, 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 the work that they can do and then let the highest paid person do the work that only they can do. So a hygien only a hygienist can scale a root plane, only a hygienist can clean teeth. You can't do rubber cup propies in my state with, unless you're a hygienist. So only they can do that. And let, um, let, let me just stop you there. Let me just stop you there. Um, it's funny how Americans can afford a house and a car, mm -hmm. but they always wonder why healthcare is so expensive. So the yeah. government that passes all this regulation that makes everything high cost, then they want right. to go back to that guy to, to help pay for the system. It's like, it'd be like Bernie Sanders walks up to you, takes a baseball bat, breaks your leg, and then says, you deserve a free wheelchair. Hey, <laughs> how about you just don't break my leg to begin with? But anyway, uh, no politics, go on. Yeah, but anyway, so... So, um, so only they can do that, but an assistant can like seat the patient, review the medical history, uh, find out what their chief complaint is, take their x-rays, take impressions, um, apply fluoride. So what you do is you get the lowest paid person that can do it to do that job. So the way this works out is every patient's in the office for an hour. They spend a half an hour with the hygienist who does all the stuff that she's going to do. And then the other time is spent with an assistant who's going to do all those other things. And then that way, the hygienists, our hygienists, we work in a seven hour straight day, no lunch. Um, our hygienists will see about 13 patients a day. So guess what? If you have two patients decide not to show up, she still saw 11 patients that day. And you still got a, a profitable situation going as opposed to, you know, we have a seven hour day. We have seven patients, two of them bail. And so now she sees five patients in the course of a day, you know, and you're not going to get as much as much done. And so then the usual thing is, well, you know, the, I want to spend more time with the patients. I want to make sure they don't feel like, you know, I'm rushing them through. And it's like, well, how much time are you really spending with them when you're, you're cleaning up rooms and setting and setting up rooms when you're shooting x-rays and, you know, uh, and, and trying to get them not to talk so that you can get the x-ray taken. Um, and when you're doing all those other things, shoving the, the fluoride in and with the, I can't talk then either. So, I mean, really they have as much time or more time than they do on a straight one hour per patient um, schedule. And here's, here's the other thing. I, I don't have hair, but you do. How much, how often do you get your hair cut and what do you pay for that? Um, I cut it myself and I do it about every three or four weeks. You cut it yourself? Yeah. No, you, you don't. Go you go to the barbershop and they take that, the, the ration, they say, what, you know, which one do you do, a two or a three? And you go, oh, a three. They slap it on there, they cut the sides, then they clip the top a little bit and you're done. You do your own hair? Uh, for years now, yeah. Holy, I've lost I do my own hair too. I do, <laughs> I do. I, I get in the uh, shower and I uh, I brush, then I floss, uh -huh. and then I uh, shave. But how are you married? Yes. How much? How does she? How often does she go get her hair cut? And uh, yeah, don't hear this. She cuts her own hair too. <laughs> oh my god! Are you guys bankrupt? Do you need? Do you want me to send you a case of ramen noodles? Uh, but anyway, my my point was being this. My point was being this. Um, the insurance PPO fee, um, um, fight. Uh, instead of spending your whole life fighting this, why don't you look at the economic reality? We have two hundred years of economic theory from Adam Smith to today, and the person who wins isn't the one who has the patent. He has the lowest cost. In airlines, mm -hmm. Southwest Airlines has twenty seven percent. Um, um, Costco, Price Club, Sam's. Ikea, furniture. So when these fees come down, the dentists all want to fight it and say, no, I want the fees to go back up. But when the fees come down, you get more market share. And right now, a cleaning exam and bite wing, um, you can't do it for what the average girl goes and pays for hair. What I'm seeing in the real world is that the, the girls are paying 80, 60 or less, and the dentists are charging 100, 120, 140. And so if you know they'll go pay for their hair, nails, and teeth, they'll, they'll do that, but you've made it expensive. And, and who's made it expensive? 
only the government. The, if the government did not exist, we would not even be having this conversation. But the government's main expenses, so you have to use game theory. So with accelerated hygiene, you can get this down to where it couldn't cost any more. I mean, I still think it's absurd that um, in all national health care schemes, if you just make the patient pay for 5% coming, you know, they always brag that, oh, I had a bypass, it didn't cost me a nickel. Well, who in economics said that's a good idea? Quite the contrary. Everybody in economics says that's a horrible idea. No one price shopped. No one in Toronto looked into the fact that maybe if they drove over to Edmonton instead of a 5% cone payment on 75000 they would have done a 5% cone payment on 50000 So now, and, and now you don't get anybody. So when the doctors are billing procedures they didn't do, well, now the human's not even looking at the bill to see the fraud because why is he looking at a bill? He didn't get a bill. Oh, so you don't want the person that got the surgery done to see the bill to see if the surgery even build the crowd for all what what if you had a bypass they build for a pancreatic cancer i mean couldn't you say i think there's something wrong so everybody wants you to look at the fee and 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 if as you lower the fee you increase market share so um so do you take ppos uh we don't anymore i used to when i was early in practice okay we'll talk about that so why so everything i just said was uh was wrong but uh, to you so so explain explain why so when I, when I first got in practice, I was going bankrupt. You heard that part of the story. And so I signed up for all the HMOs and PPOs that I could get my hands on. And what I found was as the HMO patients came through, I found a lot of decay around restorations that need to be replaced. And we, because it was a capitation plan, I had to replace all the amalgams. That's how long ago this was um, at no charge. So, you know, and I would have these patients come in with literally their entire mouth needed to be redone just all their fillings need to be redone because they had so much decay. Um, and I would ask the patient, well, what did the doctor before me say? He's like, oh, they were going to watch it and see what was going on. I was like, okay. And so I, I kind of did my thing. And I had promised myself that if I got to a point where I didn't want to see the patient walk in the door, I would, I would stop. So one day I was, uh, I had two patients. One was a fee service patient and one was an HMO patient. And both of them needed a crown. And the one, the crown was like a couple of hundred bucks and the other crown was like 900 bucks. And both of them looked at me and whistled and went, that's a lot of money. And I decided that I could listen to the whistling a lot better at 900 bucks than I could at 200 bucks. And so I kind of decided, you know, I need to phase myself out of the HMO market and move more toward the PPO market. So I did that and then we were doing PPOs. And then one year MetLife decided that they weren't gonna pay for periodic exams anymore because I was in there anyway, I guess, is what's the way they figured it, doing the cleaning. And so they weren't going to pay for those anymore. And at that point, I went, okay, MetLife is gone. And so I just dropped MetLife. Just, it really made me mad. I, I just dropped it. And what I found was that most of those patients stayed anyway and either shifted to one of my other PPOs or just paid me fee for service. And then I was like, maybe we're on to something here. And then I just, I kind of just kept doing that. Each year, the worst one, I would drop and I made sure that my, in office, you know, uh, marketing was good. I made sure that we were really taking care of patients. Um, and that's the way I worked through basically dropping all the PPOs. A number of years later, I signed on with Delta because they had a fee schedule that was not too onerous. So I'm like, okay, so if I do this, I realize this is your top of the line plan. But if I get on this one, then I need to not have to go on the other ones. And they said, absolutely, no problem. I'm like, okay. And that worked for about a year. And then the following year, they sent me a thing and said, well, if you're going to do this, you have to do that. And at that point, I dropped them, and we were kind of done. Um, but we, we played this game back and forth over and over over the years. Um, do you um, – well, I, I, don't want, I don't want to go off onto uh, insurance and non-insurance uh, because, again, especially to our international viewers, I cannot – you know I can't stand the term United States of America because you can't compare Parsons, Kansas to Manhattan. You can't compare Miami – to Alaska, you can't compare San Francisco um, to um, you know Parsons, Kansas. I mean, it's it's a huge country, and you know I, I always hear all this debate where people say, uh, "Well, this country doesn't." Yeah, yeah, that country has less people than California. Um, you know, when you're talking about the United States, um, it's a third populous country. So, does this work in the? You know, it's China, India, United States, and Indonesia. Well, the United States is about the same size as Indonesia. Um, you know, so would this work in Indonesia? And they say, well, no. Okay, so you know that Indonesia and Denmark are different. You know that mm -hmm. Canada has less people than California. So, um, so it, it's a big regional country that's uh, 
it's very, very hard to uh, um, understand it um, unless you uh, go all around it. So, um, so profitable hygiene was accelerated. Uh, that's the, the, the key there. Um, yeah. Efficient extractions. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. If you can't pull a tooth, um, you shouldn't be called a doctor. Right. I, I mean, you, I mean that, 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 should, that should be like dental, kindergarten, grammar school. You're five years old, the first class. Here's your teacher, Sister Mary Aloysius. She's been a dentist for 30 years, and the first thing she's going to teach you is to pull the loose wiggly tooth for the tooth mm-hmm. fairy. I mean, if you, and the minute you walk away from that procedure, you are disconnected from reality. I, I had a, an Do you associate- agree with that, or is that too extreme? I, I think that you need to learn how to, I think you need to be able to pull teeth. I think you need to be able to take care, like I said earlier, of emergencies that walk into your practice and, and take care of those people, which means you need to know how to pull a tooth and, and not one that has a nice crown on it and it's wiggly and it's periodontally involved, but one where it's decayed into the bone, the guy's big and healthy, and you got to be able to figure out how to get that thing out of there. And the same thing with, the, with the, doing root canals. You know, if, if they walk in and it hurts, it's going to be a molar nine times out of 10, it's going to be a molar, you know, so they need to be able to do that. But I had, I had an associate years ago, patient broke number nine. Uh, he prepped 11 and, uh, and eight for a bridge. And then he sent the patient to the oral surgeon to have number nine extracted. And I, and I was, I was working there the same day and I was like, Hey, I never saw you take the tooth out. Whatever happened with that case. He's like, Oh, it was a really tough extraction. I sent to the oral surgeon. And I was like, please, please, please. Ask me next time. That's about a five minute extraction. You know, it just, yeah. but, but no one had ever taught him how to do that. You know, so for him, that was almost an impossibility for you and I. We look at it and go, five minutes, maybe. You know, and, and, and it's better than anything. I mean, my favorite joy in life to this day is still pulling four wisdom teeth. And, you know, I go in and I numb. And then I set a timer for, uh, you know, eight minutes and then uh, for, for impacted wisdom teeth. You know, it's four minutes for, root canals, crowns, uh, but the pressure, you know, you got hot, cold, movement, pressure, pain. You know, I, I set the time for eight minutes on that. And then when I go in there, I hit the start deal because I'm, I'm curious what my time is. And sure. 99% of all those four teeth come out in under five minutes uh, mm-hmm. for almost 30 years. And every time I have a temporary assistant, um, a lot of times they attempt for oral surgeons. They always say, holy moly, man, I, you're, you're twice as fast as an oral surgeon. And what I like about it is it's instant gratification. I mean, as, yeah. so, as soon as you the two's out, you, you scored. You won the yeah. game. You go yeah. home. Um, yeah. Everything else is delayed gratification. Um, I mean, I, I, I can't think of anything more fun. And you have the tools. Of course, I have a slow speed setup. I have a, a 57 surgical. Um, a two inch flap heals the same amount of time as a one inch flap. I mean, I mean, you every movement is with intent and you do yep. every movement to cover the worst case scenario. You know, you're not going to go back and smudge some more and rinse and look just and, and, and with elevators. Um, I just need feel. I mean, Stevie Wonder could pull 99% of the wisdom teeth I pull because you're back there and you're getting in that little elevator in there. And as soon as you get a purchase point, you're not looking at anything. You're feeling it out. Um, but anyway, um, so so is is do they just not do it because of fear or they do it because their ego or one time they couldn't get it out, so they panicked. And that happened to me a dozen times. And my... We knew the protocol. We would put the patient in the car. We would drive him to Dr. Don Gass's office if it was during banker's hours. And if it was after hours, um, we'd uh, send it across the street to uh, Bob Sundberg. Uh, and, uh, and, um, and we had to do that until I learned how to pull out the root with the crown. Uh, so, so big deal. So, so you screw up 10 times. It, you know, it hasn't happened to me in several decades. Yeah, I, I think it's a matter of if they weren't really – you know, you, you get so much time in dental school to teach young guys how to, and girls how to do stuff, you know. And so, you know, you, you teach elevation, you teach putting the forcep on there, you teach the different motions, et cetera, et cetera. But what happens when there's nothing to grab onto? I don't really feel like they get taught very well how to take out a root um, that may be decayed below the alveolar crest. So, like, I go to that uh, the Dominican mission trip, and that's one of the things we do all day long is take students who are rising seniors – and show them how to take those teeth out because those people have had those those broken down teeth for years and years and years, um, and they're now finally coming in to get them out. And it's not a matter of 
there's not a whole lot of teeth with the crowns on them down there. You know, you just, you just learn how to get those roots out. And usually by day two, you know, we're talking rising seniors. They maybe have taken a tooth out. Um, by day two, they can handle 75% of what we're seeing come through there on their own. And in another day or two, they're even better than that. So it's not terribly complicated. It's just a matter of you got to go through it a few times. Okay, well, I've spent all this time on MondayMorningDentistry.com. You, um, the, uh, that is your website. Dental, yep. is it Dental-Maryland.com? What, what, do, you, what do you call yep. that little thing in the middle? Is that hyphen. a hyphen? Yeah. So DentalMaryland.com, uh, that, that's your patient website, right? That, that's yep. not for yep. my homies. Um, yeah, just for dental care, it'll, it'll take you there. So you also have this Smile Protection Dental Plan. So that was a, um, we started an in-house dental plan and I talked my, um, my specialists into extending the same courtesy to my patients that I did. And then I was going to take that and see if I couldn't market it to businesses. And somewhere along the way, the guy in the insurance uh, industry that I was talking with kind of backed out. Um, and then I got busy doing some other things with associates. And so it's still my, my in-office dental plan. And we're actually looking at maybe trying to revive that and see if we can take that somewhere. I mean, I don't know about you, but like I've been, I've been in practice 30 years and there's lots of ideas that come around. You know, you take a swipe at them early on and they don't quite work out the way you want them to and you come back to them. And I think that's going to be one of those, one of those uh, deals. Yeah. So what, um, and when we're looking at business books, who's, uh, my, um, uh, the, the favorite guy, um, for, um, any, anyone in practice management is going to be Jim Collins. And he started with good to great, uh, great by choice, how the mighty fell. But, but Jim, but uh, we started off built to last. I don't recommend that book anymore because that was written. I read that in the eighties and uh, uh, that's just too old. In fact, I'm going to take that off my list. But, uh, uh, but Jim Collins says that um, what he just said scientifically is he has an idea. So, you know, faster, easier, higher quality, lower cost, smaller, less money. Just aim at that with a BB gun and see if you hit it. And if you don't hit it, then think about it and um, change it up. And but you got to hit it with a BB gun. If you hit it with a BB gun, then you can put some more time and money into it and uh, load up a twenty-two rifle and uh, see if you can shoot it and hit it with a twenty-two rifle. Mm -hmm. And then if that works, then you say, "Hey, it's time to get leveraged and take some savings or other people's money and build a cannonball and blast that target." Um, yeah. But what the young do is they have an idea and they think they walk on water and they've never stuck their tongue in an electric socket. So they load up a cannonball and they shoot, they miss, they're out of money, they're out of gunpowder, they put all their metal in one ball and they're bankrupt. And, right. uh, and, and speaking of bankrupt, that's another thing the young kids do. I see it all the time. I was talking to this kid. I had lunch with him uh, on yesterday and um, um, he doesn't even have a line of credit. So he's in a financial problem. He's been practicing for 20 years. I said, well, what, what's your LOC, your line of credit? So when you look at the bankruptcies each year, 40 to 60,000 businesses, um, the number one cause is they, they run out of cash. So during a contraction, and I'm getting a little nervous because I lived through, you know, we, we got out of high school in 80. That was the worst. 87 Black Monday. That I mean, we graduated from dental school. And and, and what was our reward in October? Black Mo Black Thursday. Uh, stock market shrunk a quarter. Then we did it in Y2K. We did it in Lehman's. But my God, when if something falls through the, the floor, and, and it's always short. It's, only, it's usually only a year or two max. Um, mm -hmm. If it falls through the floor and something happens, you don't have to start laying off staff and selling stuff. You already established a line of credit. So when times are good... They loan money to anybody and give you lines of credit. And then when it's bad, they don't give money to anybody. So you yeah. need your LOC before you need it. And, in fact, I just had my um, year in um, financial meeting. This is February 17th. Uh, so we just did ours last week. And I um, said, um, why is the LOC at 500000 And they're like, well, we don't need it. Well, you don't know we don't need it, but see if you can get it to a million. You never know. I mean, I mean, just ask Chase, um, but you, you need uh, you need that before it happens. So we'll take smile, uh, smile Protection Dental Plan. Do you think the homies would like looking at that site, or should I just take it off completely? I'd take it off. Yeah, there's not much there. Okay, I will take that off completely. Uh, but you still have more sites to come. Um, well, no, that was a Smile Protection Plan. Uh, Monday morning, uh, Dental Maryland, uh, that's, your, that's your office. Um, so, so what is, um, God, I can't believe, uh, that was a, that was a fast hour. 
Um, we talked about um, profitable hygiene with accelerated hygiene. Um, and I'm going to call that profitable accelerated hygiene. Uh, efficient extractions, anesthesia techniques, uh, surgical extractions uh, for the general B, uh, B, uh, GP. Um, my gosh, what else? Uh, what else should we talk about while I have you on the show? Uh, we ended up starting a, a dental assistant school. Oh, that's right. That's the one I was thinking of. Which okay, is so small to the dental assistant school of Maryland. Yeah. So we we uh, we bought one of those those programs and, and put it in place. It took me it took me four years to get the state of Maryland to approve the thing, which was ridiculous. But then we started having. Wait, will you, will you say that again? It took, it took me four, four years to get the state of Maryland to approve it. Oh, okay, so all you all you big socialists, what, what did he just say? You have this herd that's been living for fifty thousand years, and a hundred billion humans have gone and gone before there even was a government. And then when I'm lecturing in the Caribbean, I'm like, well, what are you doing? Well, I'm trying to buy that de- that building there to put a dental office. Well, what's going on? Uh, well, I mean, I'm in Jamaica, and it takes four to six months uh, before the government replies to it. And then, uh, then, then our lawyer will reply to maybe another four to six months. Oh, oh so so you're going to build a dental office, but it's, it's going to take a couple of years to open because of the government. And then, and then, and then the same conversation, that guy thinks the government's going to save them. I mean, what, what, when do they realize that the government is the problem, it's not the solution? I mean, if you're trying to get off drugs, you shouldn't go move in with your dealer. I mean, you know, so, so the bottom line is um, um, it, it took you four months for the government? Four years. Four years. I mean, it's just, oh, my gosh. Yeah. But anyway, um, so, so, then, um, so now you have the Maryland Assistant, the Maryland Dental Assistant School. Uh, it's called MDAS Online. So, is this a, a virtual school? It will be soon. So, we the way the the program works is they come twice to the office, three hours each time for um, lectures and hands on. And what we're finding is that they're having a tough time making it to the office. So, what we're hoping to do is to put the lecture part online and then have them come to the office once a week um, to get them through that process and then. Uh, get them through the school. So, but, uh, so the didactic um, you could take anywhere is going to be online. And right. then where they need to be there, the hands-on uh, right. is when, uh, well, that's a, well, that, that's a nice uh, smooth invention. Uh, how, how's that going? Um, so far it's been going pretty well. The biggest problem is quite frankly, the students have trouble, A, they have trouble paying for it. Um, so we've had to like make payment plans and that sort of thing. Lots of them are in life situations that aren't really supporting their trying to get to do this sort of thing. And then. And what does that mean? What, what was that code time. for? What was their life what situation? That for? That's like um, they're, um, you know, they broke up with the boyfriend and they moved out and they can't support themselves. And now they have to, they're trying to work a job, support themselves, go to school, do the, the, the studying they need to do. And they're working a couple, three jobs just to try to, try to hold heart and soul together. Um, but those, just those kinds of things, having trouble studying, you know, they won't set aside the time to study. And so they, they come and take, uh, take quizzes and they're not doing so good. And so we're, we're doing a lot of life coaching, quite frankly, um, in the course of getting them through the school. But the flip side of that is that right now in my state, it is really tough to find dental assistants. And I'd say the last four dental assistants we have came out of our dental assisting school. So I'm, I'm pretty happy about that, that situation. Okay. Um, so back, so you also had another e- website, the CDI group. I have no idea what that is. It was uh, the CDI group focus on dentistry. We'll take care of the rest. 40 years of experience in dental plan administration. We provide discount membership plans. Was that the, the group you used to make your, um, uh, the, um, the one we were talking about, the, uh, the smile plan? No, the, the Smile Protection Dental Plan is completely within our office. We didn't use any group at all to do that. Huh. We came it ourselves. We developed it ourselves. I've not, I've not even heard of that. CDI? Yeah, the CDI group. The CDI okay. group. Okay, so uh-huh. that, that wasn't your plan. So that, that, that was my error. So um, so you got the, um, the Smile Protection Dental Plan. We're going to take that off. Monday Morning Dentistry, Dental mm-hmm. Maryland. And yep. this is um, um, your dental, your hygiene school was um school yeah mdas online and um 
and how, how's that um how, how's that working out for you so far so far pretty well i mean like i said we've had some challenges along the way but you know, it's we, we started, we, we did what we thought was the right thing to do, and then as we've encountered problems, we've adjusted and shifted, and hence the trying to put the didactic online so they only have to come in the door once a week instead of twice a week. We're hoping that will help get some people through and solve some problems for them. If they can do it, the uh, the didactic on their own time at their own convenience, I think that would be helpful. So you um... – so MDAS, um, um, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there should be more than 74,000 new openings for dental assistants up to the year 2022. The dental profession is currently facing a shortage of trained assistants. Well, the trend I see is um, they're starting to, um, just like Arizona, they passed that expanded uh, the EFTA. So will, will yours get them to EFTA? We don't have EFTA in my state. But do you see EFTA coming down the, the pike? I would love to see EFTA coming down the pike. I don't. I don't see it right now. You don't see it right now. They're having trouble just getting just dental assistance at all. Uh, we have people call the school regularly and say anybody like a warm body, anybody in class. We don't care. We just need some people. I had I had to, to convince the uh, the committee for the advisement of secondary education that we actually needed more dental assistance in our state because they had done a survey in two thousand and nine and asked dentists if they needed more assistance. And the, overall, they basically said no. And I said, well, dude, in 2009, you're just a year past 2008 when the stock market fell. And most guys are just trying to hang on to the, the people they had and not have to lay anybody off. But that's the survey they were going by. So then I had to survey dentists in my area. And literally everybody said yes, except one guy. And then I went through and talked to the committee. I said, look, if I'm off by 90%, you guys, we still are not turning out enough dental assistants in this state, and we're not turning out enough by hundreds. And so they, and the one guy looked at me and said, "Well, I'd feel better if you could guarantee him a job coming out of the school, but okay." And I was, I was just livid. I was just like, "You got to be kidding me! Like, there's not nearly enough assistants around here." Yeah, and um, I'm, uh, I mean, who who would want to tell someone their career? Uh, was limited to uh, suctioning spit and all that kind of stuff. Uh, with the dental assisting school, how do you weigh in with the um, the, the the saliva um, um, techniques? Uh, this um, what, what's the, the one? Um, what, what's the one you bite down on? You put in your mouth. Um, oh, um, yeah, I know what you're talking about. That anyway. thing. That thing. Yeah. Um, um, do you, do you, do you like that? Um. I like it okay. I, I much prefer to have a assistant there helping with the procedure, helping to maintain the field. Um, I know a lot of guys like that, especially if they don't have an assistant. Like they're the they're the associate, so sometimes they have an assistant, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't get the good assistant, you know that kind of thing. Also, like the um, the Optrigate, the thing that you you put in there and it kind of spreads the cheeks and everything. That's I, I like that pretty well. Also, we use that a, a fair amount of the time when we're doing surgery. Well, hey, um, my gosh, um, that was a um, um, an amazing, uh, an amazing hour with you. I'm just just making sure I didn't forget anything I talked about. I think you, you covered everything. Um, you know, you're really good at making online courses. A great marketing thing for you to do is uh, make an online C course for Dental Town, because uh, then they'll get to see you. They'll get to know you. Um, it's it's kind of like speaking. A lot of these people want to get out and start becoming speakers. They don't realize you can scale your brand name a thousand times faster digitally uh, mm -hmm. than you're ever going to do to a state. Because I remember when I started lecturing, um, you know, the first four or five years, um, if you had 100 people in the room, you thought you're you're on fire. And yeah. now, now if you do a podcast and it went to less than a thousand people uh, just on YouTube, you like you like you might, might not have uploaded it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so um, yeah, I would love to have a a, a, a course or um, if you ever want to do an article, you could do an article on your online uh, one hour root canal. That would be okay. a cool thing. Do an article and then that would drive them to your website. Sounds good, yeah. And, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, oh. and, I, and I'd like you to do it kind of uh, quick because I know how old you are. You're as old as me. If you, if you don't do it by Tuesday, will there even be another Monday? <laughs> I'm hoping to make it to my hands-on course in April. <laughs> and, 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 tell, and tell us one more time, how, how do they register for that hands-on course in April? That's the endo one? Yeah, uh, mondaymorningdentistry.com, and there's a button on there that says hands-on courses. 
the website just got redone. So the, the your your comment about the two ninety five to eighteen ninety five is is pertinent for me. Uh, the the only other one is on the AGD credit. You say for FAGD M credit and MAGD credit. So that, that's just a typo. But uh, uh, love uh, love what you're doing. Um, really, I'm a huge fan of everything you're doing. And it was just a Monday morning dentistry dentistry MMD. Um, um, what was that? The most famous uh, uh, NFL deal back in the day it was the Monday Morning Quarterback. Remember that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, did, did you? Did you? Uh, um, were you a big fan of the Monday Morning Quarterback? I didn't. I didn't really see it much, but I remember that it was that it was there. Yeah, but uh, hey, um, gosh, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Uh, hey, thank it was you. an honor to podcast you, and uh, I hope to see you on the message boards at dentaltown.com. All right. Sounds good. I appreciate it, Howard. All right. Have a great day, buddy.